and then you think, oh, I can move closer because there's a layer of protection in front of me. Yeah, that's crazy. No, actually, I'm not kidding. I think I'm feeling another row in somehow, but we'll figure, we'll see. We'll play with it, make it work. Ah. So this morning, um, I don't know if you ever had to uh, break a contract. You guys ever had to do break a contract? I've, we've had to do it this past year because of COVID, and we couldn't travel to Korea. So you had to, you got on Airbnb, and you have to cancel it. And for the most part, we got most of the money back. But for some, you know, they charge you a slight fee, right? And it's that whole idea of, well, I was going to do this, and you're going to do this, and we came to an agreement. And then, you know, there was some impacts to it. Um, sometimes there's things that are other things that you have that are like warranties, right? Sometimes they're warranties, and you're, if you, most like your phones or sometimes, or maybe other things, if you open it, you're breaking the warranty of not m messing around with the stuff until you give it back to them to fix. So if you break, if you open it up, I think in computers and some things, you usually have a little, little uh, sticker that says, if you punch a hole here to get to the screw to open up the, the chassis, yeah, you're breaking the warranty. And so you never really think about it. Actually, for me, it's a, a big thing. Like, do I open this up and then I can't return it? But by that point, I don't really care, so I'm going to open it anyway. But, you know, there's always, that, there's always that question, right? If I do this, then I can't take it back because there's some unexpected consequences. Um, as you look into, the book of, look into the book of Malachi today, that's kind of the idea here that, that Scripture has, this idea of having a contract and breaking it, and then what's the impact to, between you and God? And sometimes we don't always see it, right? Um, but other times we do. Um, so this morning, we can look into, you can turn your Bibles to uh, Malachi. And um, he's, he's specifically, he's talking about marriage and some other things, but it's, you know, it's over this bigger idea of what happens when we violate our contract with God. All right. Okay, so this is verse 10. Um, have, we not, have we not all one father? Did not one God create us? Why do we profane the covenant of our fathers by breaking faith with one another? Okay, and you have to remember, this is in the book of Malachi. They are coming out of X, or this is between, <laughs> sorry. Malachi seems to be written uh, somewhere in between uh, Nehemiah and Ezra, right? And so now they're trying to figure out What's, this is like the last word that God has before New Testament, like 400 years. And so they're trying to think, we, we finally got together, back together as one, right? How's not, how are we all not one father? And the, the commentator is saying the word one there keeps being repeated because before exile, right, you had two kingdoms, a northern kingdom, southern kingdom. Before that, there was one kingdom, right? They separated at um, Solomon's son, did some weird things, and so they broke into two kingdoms. After exile, they come back to one group. And so Mal Malachi is kind of pointing this out, that God has brought them back together. We have all one father, did not one God create us, recognizing God's you know, control over their lives, that God is their spiritual father. Right? And then he goes on and says, why do you profane the covenant of our father by breaking faith with one another? Meaning that hey, we're, all, we're all part of one religious group, we're all part of one ethnic group. Why do we keep... Breaking faith. That word breaking faith there means to um, betray one another. It's sort of it's sort of like as humans, we all say, hey, we're human. You know, if you need help, I should help you um, because we're, we're humans versus animals that's just going to attack each other. Right? That's, that, that's that idea of, okay, we're one people group. Right? And so this is kind of where he's starting off. He's saying, why do we violate, right, the word profane there means to violate. Why are we violating the terms of the covenant, of God's covenant, with, when we um, betray one another? Because we're all God's people, right? It's, look in the New Testament, it, it looks like you have Christians suing other Christians, and Paul calls them out of it and says, hey, you're the same faith. Why are you suing one another? Why are you taking each other to court? Hasn't God given you wisdom, enough wisdom to figure it out amongst yourselves? And so this is, this is the same attitude uh, here in the Old Testament that, that's being shown that says, hey, because we're all one family of faith, why are you betraying one another? And then he's going to give you two sets of betrayals, right? In verses uh, 11 and 12 is one set of betrayals, and then in 13 through 15, or 15, 13 through 16, uh, there's another set of betrayals. Okay, so the first 
one. And Judah has broken faith. Right? He is betrayed. Uh, the detestable thing has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. Judah has desecrated the sanctuary the Lord loves by marrying the daughter of a foreign god. All right, so what's happening? Right? They're violating the faith. They're, break, they're betraying God by doing this. They're intermarrying with unbelievers. They, in the Old Testament, okay, back in, when they're coming out of Egypt and they're going through, uh, turning into the promised land, God had all these rules for them. And one of them is this. Do not intermarry. Uh, do not intermarry with them. Do not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons. Uh, for they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. And the Lord's anger will burn against you and, you, and will quickly destroy you. Right? And it's this idea that there's this purity there of worship towards God that God is expecting. Right? And so when they're marrying these other daughters or they're, they're marrying people who are not believers, that they were dragging them off to, to start worshiping other gods. That was, that's what God was trying to prevent. Because okay, you're thinking, well, in this day and age, you're wondering, wait, so does this mean um, don't marry people of other ethnicities or other races? Or, you know, you could, I know we bring it to the New Testament time, we're like, oh, what is this? How does this apply to us, really? Um, if you look at the Old Testament again, there are people, there are times when people actually married out of the Jewish culture, okay? Like Ruth. And one of the people in the line of Jesus, Ruth was not a, was a Moabitess, right? She wasn't, she wasn't a Jewish person. Moses, his wife, actually was not also a Jew. <laughs> so there's these other um, things, there's other people in the Old Testament that, are married, uh, that were married into the Jewish family, but not, they didn't lead them away. So God isn't talking about don't marry someone from a different race or ethnicity, but he's talking about there's a sense of, are you going to, is this person that's coming, or is you're marrying, are they following me or not? Are they willing to follow me? Like, Ruth was willing to leave her people and her religion and her gods in order to follow, to follow Naomi into Israel, right? Moses, if you look at his wife, she's the one that actually went and circumcised his sons, right? The, the angel, if you read it somewhere in Genesis, right, the angel of death's coming to kill him kill Moses and his sons because they, didn't, they weren't circumcised and his wife circumcises his sons. So there's this aspect where it's not about the, the race, but it's about the religion. It's about the unbelief. So again, now how do we bring this down into us? This idea that you know, following God or having a faith in God is important. <clears throat> well, there's this, as I was in my casual reading, I saw this story about this class uh, at Northwestern University. It's called Marriage 101. And in this class, their whole point is to make people recognize that there's no such thing as soulmates, that there's not such thing as love at first sight. That's kind of the objective of the class, actually. And they did this interview. They said, here, here are the four things that we want people to get out of it. Uh, Self-understanding is the first step to having a better relationship. It's not about finding the person that matches you but making yourself right for the other person, right? This, uh, that you need to be the right person for them to marry you, okay? Because it's, otherwise we always look around for someone to make me right. And it's like, no, no, you be right first and then you marry the other person. Second one is you can't mar avoid marital conflict, but you can learn better how to, well, you can learn how to handle it better. And this is the idea of more about, um, it's not blaming, it's not oversimplifying things, um, but it's actually seeing your, per seeing your spouse as a partner that you're trying to face a problem together. Unfortunately, as men, sometimes we blame, this, blame our spouses for things that, wait, why didn't you? And okay, if you think of it in biblical terms, this is called the sin of Adam. <laughs> we, blame, we blame our spouse for things that we didn't do <laughs> or that we should have done or that we weren't the right person. Okay, so hopefully the guys get the right idea. Okay, the, second, the third one is... Um, a good marriage takes skill and communication skills. That's probably a big one, learning how to talk to each other. Um, probably more than that for, again, I see it in my relationship, is learning how to care for other people in ways that they need to be cared for. So their example is 
they're in this class, the student has to go and find an older couple to you know, do an interview with them. And they said they're supposed to watch them and see what do they do. Does, does a husband bring a cup of water for the wife, showing caretaking skills? You know, are they sympathetic or empathetic with their wife? So there's, there's these things that they're trying to teach in this class that as believers, we go, oh, isn't that, well, I won't say it's just we should know better. But definitely things that we cover in premarital class or premarital counseling. Um, but this last one is the one that was interesting for me reading through this. Because the first three, like, oh, yeah, we, we should we know that, sort of. But he said, you and your partner te- need to have a similar worldview. And their whole thing was talking about you need to understand what is important to them, what values they hold, what they like to do on a daily basis, knowing that their experiences and why they believe certain things forms them as a whole person. You know, we, 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 they actually use the word worldview, which is surprising to me because most people don't. But for as believers, we say, yeah, you should have a Christian worldview because otherwise it causes problems with you and your spouse. Right? That's, the, that's how we would understand it. Right? And in, in, old, in the New Testament, we understand this as the uh, book of Corinthians is the idea of saying, you know, not to be yoked with unbelievers. And that's, it's, it's hard. It's a hard word to hear. I'm not, I'm not, I mean, looking at how I was raised and how I came to faith and the people, you know, I dated. And, you know, it's, you're like, wow, wait a minute. How come, why is that? Why do we have to follow that? God, God that seems very restrictive. And if you go back and think, back to what is God trying to to say there? And it's, he says, it's not for, it's not because he's trying to be mean, but it's this idea that he has our, he has our best intent behind us, right? He, He wants the best for us. And so therefore he says, hey, this is what you, this is what's best for you. And the verse 12, he goes on. It says, as for the man who does this, whoever may be, the Lord may the Lord cut him off from the tents of Jacob, even though he brings offerings to the Lord Almighty. Right? And this is, if you were to take the word cut off, and I think a lot of us understand that implicitly just from the language, you know, for at that time it meant you know to destroy or to remove from remove from having descendants. Um, but the interest again. It's hard to hear this, uh, but this is what God continues to say from here, though. He says, you know, if you read this specifically or very particularly, he says, God's desiring obedience rather than empty sacrifice. Because right? what what's going on? The guy has married someone outside of the Jewish faith, and then God says, hey, you're not supposed to do that. And then he goes on and says, well, even if you bring me a sacrifice, this brings offerings, I'm still going to cut you off. Right? And the wording, a, a way to understand this is God desires obedience rather than false sacrifice or empty sacrifice. You can't buy God off. And this is probably a principle we have to understand for ourselves that if we are in active sin, God does not bless. And you know how to... Where do we get this idea from? And you have to go back, again, further back into the Old Testament. First right, Samuel, this is talking about Saul. Right, Saul when it was, was given an order by God. says, hey, go and fight these people, get their king, kill the king. And what does Saul do? He says he goes and gets a king, or he, he goes and uh, fights the people. He gets all the animals. He also actually killed all the animals, but he, he saved all the animals, the best to do a sacrifice before God, and he didn't kill the king. <laughs> and while he's waiting for Samuel to come, um, Samuel's late in coming, and Saul says, well, everyone's leaving. I need to do the sacrifice. And Samuel stands up and come, finally comes and says to him, has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, it's better to, it's better, <laughs> sorry. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. And to heed than the fat of rams. And you jump into Hosea, and it's a similar idea. Say, for I delight in loyalty rather than sacrifice, and in the knowledge of God 
rather than burnt offerings. He's not saying that offerings are, giving sacrifices aren't right, because that's what God commanded. But our relationship to God is not a, I come to church, I sing, I praise, I give money, I serve, and you should be happy with that. Right? that let me go do whatever I want. That's not what God is saying. You know, it's giving and doing things with the right attitude, the right motives behind it that count. Here in Matthew, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. The Pharisees are watching the disciples go through the field and they're picking grain, you know, pieces of grain off on, the, on a Sabbath, which could be, in their rules, harvesting. And they're telling, hey, how come your, how come your people aren't are doing this? And then Jesus quotes, hey, didn't David need to get bread? It was on a Sabbath. He was running away from Saul. But he says, but if you had known what this means, I desire compassion, not sacrifice, which is the Hosea passage. You would not have condemned the innocent. This idea that if we're in actively doing things that God is not pleased with, and then we expect him to bless us because we, quote, do the right Christian things, that we are expecting wrong, right? Our expectation is wrong. We're not in the right place. We're not in the right relationship with God. So we shouldn't expect to be blessed. That's what, that was the problem of, these, of the Jewish people at that time. They are doing something blatantly wrong. They're breaking the covenant, but they're still expecting God to bless them. We shouldn't expect, God doesn't change. We shouldn't expect that. Um, God will bless us if we're not following him. At the same time, let me just remind you that when we recognize what we've done wrong, and then we say, okay, God, please forgive me, that God does forgive us for that situation. So it's not something that keeps lingering, even though, you know, I know this is really complex, at least in terms of marriage. Once you're married, God says, hey, stay. Um, once you've been divorced and you have to remarry, or you remarried, God says, stay. You know, don't change your state. That's, I know it's against the minutia, but I know for some people um, in our culture right now, it's, it's hard to know, okay, how do you work all these things? How do these things fit together? I take it from Paul. It's in Corinthians. It says, stay where you're at, whatever state you're in. You can get married. It's okay. But it's better for you to stay where you are and stay single. But if you're married, don't divorce. You know, whether you're a believer or non-believer, together. Don't divorce. Stay together. Okay, that's, that's where we are. So whatever your state is, stay there. If you want to get married, don't get married. Okay, that's it. <laughs> don't <laughs> try not to make it any more complicated than that, but I, I know I am. Okay, so that was the first one. They were intermarrying with unbelievers. And again, God's saying it's for their good right, that they don't marry into unbelievers. Okay, in verse 13, another thing you do, you flood the Lord's altar with tears. You keep, oh, sorry, you weep and you will because he no longer pays attention to your offerings or accepts them with pleasure from your hands. Uh, you ask Why? It's because the Lord is acting as the witness between you and the wife of your youth, because you have broken faith with her, though she is your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant. And so this is what the the second thing they're doing here, is that they're divorcing their aged wives or aging wives. And we're assuming so that they can marry these younger, non-believing wives. So they're, you know, double Right, and this is what he's, you know, he's pointing out to them. He says, I am the witness between you and your wife. And the, when we, like, this is how you, when we end marriages, in most Christian marriages, you say what, what God has joined together, let no man separate. Meaning that God is the one that's supposed to be the witness before the marriage. Right, that's, so he's now punishing these men who are divorcing because they, they're breaking this covenant. He's enforcing it. And we talk about the wife. Um, he's using these three, I, I underlined these three uh, adjective, adjectival phrases. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not a grammar person. The, 
these three phrases to point out, well, what, why is this such a grievous thing? Why is this such a like, hurtful thing in the eyes of God? Well, it's from her youth. So they're assuming that she's, been, she's aged from her younger days to her older days. And you, in that culture, if you were divorced and you're older, there's, no, there's not a lot of possibility of getting remarried. And that was, you know, it's like if you did it when they're, not that it would be better, but if, if you did it when they're young, they could find another husband. Um, not only that, she's your partner. Uh, the word partner there means it's like, like Adam and Eve. It's like a full uh, companion is walking through life with you. You've had all this life together, and now you're saying at this point, well, you know what, we're too different. And they're not marrying them because of marital unfaithfulness, which is, you know, one of the, options, you know, one of the reasons that Jesus gives for, for divorce. It's, and it's not because they've, they've left, you know, the, the wife has left them for any reason. It's because these guys are trying to marry somebody else. Even though this is the, their companion, the person that has walked with them. And then she is the wife of your marriage covenant. And again, this, this is the covenant that is made before God. So this is, this is why God is saying, no, I'm, I'm witnessing between you. I'm, I'm punishing you because you are not living up to your end of the bargain. Again, maybe it helps to understand in those days, women were not, you know, they didn't have jobs. You know, they're t- totally dependent on their husbands. And whether, you, whether we agree with it or not, in, the, in that day and age, it was they were there to take care of the family, raise the kids. They were the, they were the stay-at-home and the husbands were the ones working in the fields, defending them for the, before the, the, the gate, you know, the courts. The women didn't have any, have any say. So if the women weren't married, and they, they had no protectors, right? They, if they were divorced in their older age, that's it. The kids don't come with them. The kids stay with the husband, unless the husband kicks them out. Right? So in that day, it's, it's God is looking and saying, hey, you know, this isn't right. And so I'm not going to be listening to your prayers. I receive no pleasure, you know, enjoyment, acceptance of your, of your sacrifices. And this is his reasoning. And it's kind of related to the first one. Has not the Lord made them one? In flesh and in spirit, they are his. And why one? Because he was seeking godly offspring. So guard yourself in your spirit and do not break faith with the wife of your youth. I hate divorce, says the Lord God of Israel, and I hate a man's covering himself with violence as well as with his garment, says the Lord Almighty. So guard yourself in your spirit and do not break faith. Right, this is a reference to Genesis. We kind of brought it up already, right? It's, you know, a, man will, a man will leave his mother and father uh, and cleave to his wife so they become one flesh. And God is pointing out here that it's not just a, a relationship, marriage relationship, it's not just a fleshly union, but it's actually the spiritual union. And the reasoning is, according to Malachi, the reason that God kept it like that or want, desires like that, if you remember, what, what was Adam and Eve's command? What was God's command to Adam and Eve? I remember way back when. Keep the garden and what? Fill the earth. So this is going back to God's command to them, saying, why did God make them husband and wife? Why do you only have Adam and Eve, not another Another woman there for Adam. <laughs> There's only two people. He made them one flesh, gave him a command, fill the earth, because he was seeking a godly offspring. So that what? So the knowledge of God could cover the whole earth. Right? There's, God is using this as an example, saying, hey, this is my intent. You're breaking my intent. And so he says, guard yourself in your spirit. Do not break faith. It means, the word garden means to examine, you know, keep track of, attentively, keep track of yourself. Um, In marital relationships, I call this keeping the walls low. It's very easy in a a marital relationship to to make walls high, holding grudges, not being forgiving, not not being thankful, um, not considering you're part of the problem and whatever problem it is, um, right? That's what it means to, to, for married couples to guard ourselves in a marital relationship. However, God also talks about 
relationship between believers and himself in terms of a marriage covenant. If you look in your book of Ephesians, how does God describe the marital relationship? Says, where, as Paul writes, he says, um, as he finishes this whole section about husband and wives, how, you know, how the wives have to respect their husbands and the husband has to love his wife as Christ loved the church. At the very end of it, he says, but I'm talking about Christ, the relationship between Christ and the church. And it's uh, like, oh, wait a minute. So the marital relationship, the covenant that we have between husband and wife is supposed to represent how God and ourselves, how we interrelate. So with that in mind, you know, this idea of keeping faith for ourselves. How do we keep faith with God? Knowing that God is looking at us as a spouse and saying, are you violating the, you know, this agreed upon covenant between you and me as, you know, as my sons and my daughters, as believers? Right? What is God? How, how, do we, how do we keep faith with God? That's, that's the question, right? Because if we want God to bless us, we can't be walking in a broken relationship with him, right? We can't be having active sin. So on the negative side, it's this. You know, watch yourself carefully for thoughts and behaviors that break your relationship with God. Now, what, is, what could this mean? Or what, this might, what might this look like? It's a being aware if we have resentment or bitterness towards God. I'm not saying that we need to not be, get angry or bitter or resentful towards God, uh, but it's to recognize that and say, okay, is this that you acknowledge the feelings that you have towards God? And in time... I hope that God will help to resolve it. But it's actually recognize it first. Um, it might mean looking at how you, literally how you act towards others or how you treat others and seeing and being sensitive to, saying, and to God saying, because we're, we're, keep, we're keeping watch of ourselves, that as we look at how we interact with others, that we judge it and go, okay, was that? Right? <laughs> am I doing right before God, or am I not? And it's, you know, in the moment, in, in the spur of the moment, it might be, yeah, it might be hard. You're like, wow, I'm so angry, I'm so frustrated. That's, you know, can't help that part, but the reflection after that going, oh, okay, that was probably not a good thing. I probably need to go say sorry, or whatever it may be. Um, it also might be looking, you know, considering the content that you watch or that you read on your your phone or the computer. That as you look at that, as you read that, that you go, oh, is this leading me away from God? Okay, because it's keeping the walls low, right? Is this leading me away from God? And sometimes the stuff we read and sometimes we watch, it doesn't lead us away from God, but it starts putting thoughts in our mind that are not healthy for us or could lead us away from God. You look at King Solomon. He had, what, 700 wives or something? He was the wisest man on earth. And what happened to him? Beginning part of life started out really well, right? God, give me wisdom. I can't lead your people. There's too many of them. There's you know, numerous stars, or sand on the shore, the stars in the sky, and I, I can't lead them. And then at the end of his life, it says that all his wives, because he had followed different gods, led him away from the Lord. So whether that means loss of salvation, don't know but it means that he started worshiping other gods, breaking his covenant with God. Right, so it's always, you call it a slippery slope, right? Starts off small, little things, little things, and then the little things get to a point where it becomes a big thing. And then we find out, oh, we're really far from God now. And so it, the encouragement is to keep faith with God means we need to watch ourselves, watch our thoughts, watch our behaviors, watch examine ourselves and then say, okay, is there any way that's displeasing to you, Lord? Show it to me. And pray that prayer. I mean, that's what we do before communion, or we should do before communion. Examine ourselves. Because communion is what? It's the representation of us being united to, God, to Christ. Right? It's, a, it's a representative of our relationship to God. And so when we take that, and it says, don't take it in an unworthy manner, that unworthy manner is not examining ourselves first and then saying, hey, God, here's some things I need to ask for forgiveness for before I take communion. That's the, that's the point. Okay, so that's the negative side. The positive side um, is proactively doing things that reinforce relationship with God. 
And I think in this day and age, it's this idea of really, it's creating blank space, unplugged time to hear from God, which I think for all of us is really difficult because of our phones and the life we have right now. It's very easy to live a very plugged in life. There's no spare time in our schedules. But if there's spare time, we pull out our phone. I'm guilty of this, not trying to point fingers, okay? Standing in line to buy stuff. I guess it's only be a couple of minutes. Let's see, I can read at least half a chapter. Right? It doesn't, because where does God speak? I, I don't know your experiences, but God has only spoken to me when those times when I've had that blank time. When I've had the two weeks of, before there was, a, before internet, before the, it was a little easier, because there was nothing else to do, of arguing with God. You're like, hey, God, what about this? What about this? And you just go back and forth in your mind because you're like, there's no TV. Well, we didn't have TV. You had to buy a cable TV back then. You could even get bunny ears. Not that. I'm like, am I that old? <laughs> Internet service, you had to pay for it, and it was a dial-up, and you know, that whole thing. Okay, so there was, there was this whole, there's all these things that made it harder to just be on your phone. And we don't have that blank time, that blank space to hear from God. And sometimes we have to program it in to our time. Sometimes you have to literally say, okay, half an hour, I'm spending with God, and even if I don't get anything out of the first, well, five minutes, I'm still going to stick with it for the next 30 minutes. We're building that time in if we have to so that we can reinforce the relationship with God. I don't, again, I don't know how, I don't know how many of you have had those experiences. I, I know with my wife because it's, we're, you're stuck together, you're, I don't say stuck. I should replay, rephrase that. <laughs> so that we're, you can live life very easily and not talk to the other person. And if you don't talk to them about anything for a whole week, unless you make the time to talk to them, you're not going to hear anything. Especially now with your phone. I, I come back to the phone again. But it's, it's very easy to not talk and not catch up and not hear what's going on. They hear, you hear your thoughts. God is the same way. If we don't spend that time, you're not going to hear. And God breaks in every once in a while because he has to. But if we don't spend that time, we won't hear. You can be very, it's very easy to come very, become very far away from God very quickly. I mean, at least, again, just using human relationships. I feel that if I don't make that time. Okay, what else can you do? You already know the rest of these, uh, some of these other ones. You know, praying, devotional times, journaling. Um, I think one that I've, I recognize that I think we've been doing a little better is, is t talking with others about what God has been doing in your life. The lessons you learned or things that he's kind of pinging you on and saying, hey, what about this? What about this? Because I, th I think that community, that sense of walking together, as you do that, you go, oh. Somehow it opens up new ideas to you as you listen to what other people's experiences are. So you need to be in that community or in a community where you can talk about God. Again, it's very easy to go through life. I, I recognize it with my family because my family aren't believers. We can talk for a half an hour, 40, well, three hours, and still not really talk about what's going on. And it's, it's like, wow, there, we should have connected a lot deeper than we did, but all we end up doing is fighting about things at times because it's, you know, bad stuff. And it's, you can sit there and go, we talked about everything but what's really mattering, really deeply connecting with one another. And so we have to f use those times because, again, it's not because it's uh, by talking to someone else that I feel God, but it's somehow in the midst of communicating, in the midst of relating, seeing what God is doing, you know, kind of pointing it, pushing it back towards God, that we are encouraged. I mean, it, it's fun to hang out with people and just hang out and do stuff. But at some point, it has to turn towards God because it encourages us to seek after God. <sighs> this is the last passage I want to give to you. And it's, um, it comes out of Romans. It's Romans 14, 23, and this is our, one of our professors, you know, he, was, he was talking about how do we live life? How do we, how do we know what's right? How do we do what's right and everything else? 
And it comes out of the, the last part of 14.23. The, fir- the beginning part of 14.20 of Romans 14 is all this idea of you have to eat the right things. or you have, They're having a conversation about what you should eat, what days are holy. You know, and, and just there's differences between believers or preferences. And at the very end of it, Paul says, hey, this is, this is how we end this matter. It says, but the man who has doubts is condemned if he eats because his eating is not from faith. And it's because they're talking about what they eat and what they don't eat and what days to eat and what not, days not to eat. <coughs> Excuse me. At the very end, he says, and everything that does not come from faith is sin. That no matter what we do, it has to be based on our knowledge and our relationship with God. That whatever we choose to do, that we have to have the conviction that this is what God wants. And I know for some things, what should I order for dinner? Probably not a big deal. But when it comes down to certain actions, certain things I read, certain things I do, knowing, hey, is this really going to be drawing me closer to God? Or is it going to be improving my relationship with God? Is it going to draw me away and hinder me? Or is it going to cause me to just fall into sin? I need to evaluate those things. Because whatever we do, it needs to be done from faith. Saying this is what God has, you know. Before God, I can say, yes, this is what I know that I'm supposed to do. Scripture lines up, everything lines up. Yes, this is what I need to do. That's how we keep faith with God. It's evaluating. Sometimes you might go, wow, it's so much evaluating, but it's the idea of evaluating our lives and then saying, God, yes, I want to know you. Continue to teach me, continue to show me who you want me to be. Let me pray for us. Lord God, we thank you uh, for being our God. Lord, we thank you for your great love for us. Um, It's so great that we don't always know it. Thank you for wanting the best for us, even when we don't want it. And Lord, thank you for changing our hearts. Help us to seek you. Help us to know uh, what you desire for our lives. Not not in a, let me sit here and just wait till you tell me, but a, let me explore it with you. Let me walk with you and uh, ask questions of you. And allow you to speak back to me as I ask and I seek and I ask others and talk with people. And, and Lord, we thank you for being a loving father that desires to draw us closer to you, desires to show your love to us. God, help us to know you. Help us to love you more every single day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.